Welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 15 where we'll discuss the question, what does the study of fossil sponges reveal about the transition between single cell and multicellular life? So what is a sponge? Sponges are regarded as multicellular since they're composed of many cells, but are not considered metazoans since they don't have any specialized tissues, no real standard layers of cells, or even nerve cells. They're placed to integrate all their own, the parazoans. Sponges can easily regenerate, and when a sponge is passed through a fine screen and the cells are broken apart, the individual cells can actually come back together to form a new sponge new colonies of cells which can adhere to each other. However, individual cells cannot survive long on their own. They require a community of cells to acquire food and nutrients. As such, sponges represent an important transition between true single-celled organisms and multicellular organisms which have specialized tissue. This versatility of the sponges makes them highly successful in the fossil record. They first appear in the early Cambrian and are found in the world's oceans today. Sponges are sessile, benthic animals that filter feed their food on the ocean floor. They come in all sorts of sizes and morphology, which makes them difficult to classify based on their shape. The skeletons of sponges are composed of collagen protein called spongin. This spongin is what makes dead sponges so useful to scrub your back in the shower. However, spongin does not really fossilize. What does fossilize are the calcareous or siliceous spiracles that help support the framework of the sponges. These hard spiracles can be found in the fossil record despite a lack of body fossils of complete sponges. A typical sponge is basically a sac with a central cavity called the paragaster, with a wide opening at the top called the osculeum. The sponge is perforated by thousands of tiny holes called ostia, which lead into the canals into chambers lined with cells that have phalagellated tails that beat back and forth continuously, creating a current of water flow that passes into the ostia and out through the osculeum. These smaller chambers are lined with collar cells, or colonesis, which ingest food such as small single-celled organisms that are drawn into these chambers. Nourishment from the colonesis are passed into amoebasis. These are specialized cells that pass through the structure, helping to deliver this nourishment to the cells that don't line these flagellated chambers. The origin of sponges is thought to lay close to a group of single-celled organisms called the colanophilagellae. The colanophilagellates are single-celled eukaryotic organisms that travel in the water by swirling a flagella or tail. And these flagella are surrounded by a collar that traps bacteria and other small organisms which are consumed by these single-celled organisms. It's thought that perhaps a group of these colanoflagellate cells started to group together as colonies, and that was beneficial to their joint survival. Colanoflagellate are considered the closest relatives to multicellular animals and closely related to sponges. There are a number of grades or levels of complexity of sponges. The simplest are the ASCON grade, where a single chamber forms a more complex is the syncon with individual chambers lining the outer wall. And the most common but most complex is the leucon grade, which has multiple chambers of syscons opening into a central chamber. These levels of complexity are basically fractals, as each addition must maintain the central current of water flowing into the sponge and hence represents smaller by identical units with each level of complexity. Sponges can take advantage of water currents in the ocean to maximize the amount of food that passes into their chambers. Some sponges are stocked, so they can be located in the faster currents above the ocean floor. Others are fan-shaped, spreading out perpendicular to the ocean currents to capture floating food. Sponges are 
classified in the phylum Porifera, placed into two major subphylum, the Gelatinosa and the Nudia. The Gelatinosa are named after the gelatinous middle layer called the mesenchyme. Within this middle layer of goo, the amoeba cysts are free to wander, uh, delivering nutrients to various cells in the colony. This layer of goo is also home to scleroblasts. These are the cells that secrete the spiracles that hold the sponge together. The other subphylum is the nudia, which lack a middle gooey layer and instead have a framework of filaments called trabecula to hold the sponge together. Many of these can be composed of silica. The subphylum gelatinosa contains two classes of sponges, the demospongia and the calcarea, while the subphylum nudia includes the hexactinellida, or glass sponges. The extinct Arcteosynathid, the ancient cups, are placed tentatively in their own group, not close to either gelatinosa or nudia. Let's take a look at the Demosporangia. The Demosporangia is the most diverse group, with a fossil record that goes back to the Cambrian. They are recognized by their fossilized spiracles, although body fossils have also been found. They include scleric sponges, the catenids, the stromatoporids, and the sphinctozoans. Perhaps the most important of these groups are the stromatoporids, which have a fossil record from the Cambrian all the way to the Oligocene. These sponges form large reefs and are one of the principal reef building organisms during the early Paleozoic. Stromatoporids can be recognized because they have these small swellings that resemble small nipples called mammamelons, as well as star-like grooves called astrorhizins. Stromatoporids secrete silica spiracles in a likely aragonitic or calcite matrix. The osculiums open serving as the largest openings in the mammelons, while a network of flagellated chambers drew water through the Astriorhizia openings. As these colonies grew on the ocean floor, they built upward as detritus and sediment covered them, and as such formed some of the earliest reef complexes. Stromatoporids have an abundant fossil record and are particularly common in the early Paleozoic, but after the Permian are less frequent. Stromatoporids are no longer living, so we have to recreate their lifestyle based on their similarity to living sponges. The calcarea are sponges that are composed of calcite spiracles rather than silica or spongin. These are more common in the Mesozoic, and many forms of calcarea are living today. Fossil forms tend to fossilize well, which are often vase-shaped with a large opening for the oscillium. Perhaps the most beautiful of the sponges are the hexactinellidae, the glass sponges, which compose their spiracles with silica. These are known from the Cambrian until the recent, but they're rare in the ocean today and found only in bathol and abyssal zones. They often form root-like spiracles that extend into the substrate. The spiracles are often star-shaped and can be distinguished in the fossil record by applying hydrochloric acid to limestones and using a microscope to identify these sil silica spiracles. The last group is the Arcteanathian. They that form their structures out of carbonate that form reefs during the Cambrian. They're shaped like an inverted cone with a septa separating out an outer wall and an inner wall. The base of the cone has holdfasts. They're often just a few centimeters in diameter. The Archinathi are only found in the Cambrian and they serve as the major reef builders, forming bioherms with their carbonate skeletons that would accumulate on the ocean floor. This is a cool reconstruction of archaeosynathids at the Museum Victoria in Australia, showing how they would grow on top of previous generations of colonies. So the fossil record of sponges is pretty extensive, with only one of the major groups being entirely extinct. As such, sponges are an important part of the marine ecosystem and should not be overlooked. One final comment, if you do any research on, on the fossil record of sponges, you'll likely encounter the work of Keith Rigby Sr., 
who published hundreds of scientific papers on the fossil record of sponges and was a longtime professor and dean at BYU here in Utah. I hope that his work on fossil sponges will continue on with a new generation of paleontologists because so few people take the time to study fossil sponges. They are a highly neglected group of organisms, but vitally important for the understanding of marine fossils. Thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in taking a geology class here at Utah State University like this one, log on to geology.usu.edu and take a look. If you're interested in who I am and my research, take a look at my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thanks for listening.